Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jessica Gonzalez, and I am the School Mental Health Coordinator with the Mental Health Technology Transfer Center Network, also known as the MHTTC Network. Thank you for your interest in our School Telemental Health Series. Today's session focuses on strategies for addressing trauma, crises, and grief through telemental health. This is the third and final session in the series. I want to quickly thank our amazing speakers and MHTTC colleagues who helped with planning for this session. And a big thanks to all of you for joining us today. We truly hope that you find today's presentation helpful. Next slide, please. So we have made every attempt to make today's presentation secure. If we need to end the presentation unexpectedly, we will follow up using your registration information. A reminder that all attendees are muted and cannot share video. If you have a question for the presenters, please use the Q&A pod. We welcome questions throughout the presentation and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible during the second part of the session. If you have a comment or a link to share with all attendees, please use the chat box. The session recording and slide deck will be posted on our website within a few days. You will also receive an email with the presentation, following the presentation on how to access a certificate of attendance. And if you don't already, please do follow us on social media and stay in touch with us. Next slide. For those who are new to the MHTTC network, the network is funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and supports research development and dissemination, training and technical assistance, and workforce development for the mental health field. Next slide. So here is our lovely map displaying the centers that make up the MHTTC network. We have 10 regional centers, a National American Indian and Alaska Native Center, a National Hispanic and Latino Center, a Network Coordinating Office. After this presentation, please visit our website and find your center so that you may stay up to date on trainings and resources that are offered in your region. Next slide. The MHTTC network has a three-year supplement to expand training and TA on the implementation of school-based mental health services. School mental health specific activities that are put on by the MHTTCs through our school mental health initiative encompass multiple service modes, various topic areas, and populations. Next slide. This webinar series is just one example of the training that we offer the school mental health workforce, all free of cost. Next slide. This presentation was prepared for the MHTTC network under a cooperative agreement from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, also known as SAMHSA. The opinions expressed in the presentation are the views of our speakers and do not reflect the official position of the Department of Health and Human Services or SAMHSA. Next slide. As part of our um, training, we do ask that you please complete a quick survey at the end of our session. We will provide the link for the survey at the end of the session. Next slide. Okay, so we're ready to get started now. I'll start by introducing our presenter. Mm -hmm. slide. We have two presenters starting us off today who will discuss equity as it pertains to addressing trauma, crises, and grief through telemental health. We have Angela Castellanos, a licensed clinical social worker with over 25 years of expertise in the mental health care industry and school settings. She specializes in administering school mental health programs, mentoring industry professionals at the local, state, and federal levels. We also have Dr. Kazike Prince, who provides executive consultation and coaching services focused on cultural competency for individuals, teams, and organizations. Next slide. For the second part of our presentation, we have Paul Reinert. 
He has worked in the Boston area with children, families, and schools for over 30 years. He currently works at the Center for Trauma Care in Schools. We also have PJ Wenger, who is the Senior Training and Consultation Specialist with the Northeast and Caribbean MHTTC at Rutgers University and has 29 years of experience working in the field of mental health. Kazike will start us off today. Thank you so much for being yeah. with us, Kazike. I'll pass it off to you now. Cool, thank you, uh, Jessica. I really appreciate it, and, and I want to welcome everyone here. I want to touch base on a few things I think are critical for our conversation today. Uh, I think everyone has been uh, impacted in the way they have been around COVID-19, but also over the last week or so, we've had the death of George Floyd, uh, and I imagine every city across this country can tell you a story about some um, African American, brown, Latinx person who's been uh, suffered at the hands of uh, police violence and brutality. And so I thought it was important that we bring up this conversation about racialized trauma, because whether it's you viewing the, uh, the beating, the death, uh, all the different kinds of experiences we have on television, online, social media, those are traumas that are being built up in our body. Um, and so the question I think I would ask you to consider is how do you find a way of releasing that pain in a way that actually benefits not just yourself as a professional, but for the folks that you're serving? And um, there's a book called My Grandmother's Hands by Resna Minicum, who talks about this idea of clean pain and dirty pain. And clean pain is the pain that we find ways of going through pain, but we do it in integrity, right? We not, we not knowing what the end result's gonna be, we, we listen, we reflect, we engage in healing in a way that uh, we uh, experience pain in a way that we are uh, better for it versus being, uh, being a detriment. Whereas dirty pain is really a, a responding to that pain with the fear and conflict and all the challenges that many, many of us have experienced. So what it looks like is avoidance, deflection, gaslighting, projecting, and so that dirty pain ends up transferring the pain to others. Uh, so regardless of your racial background, dirty pain becomes a vehicle for actually continuing the challenges, whereas clean pain is a way of uh, digesting and um, really not letting the pain to continue in many uh, ways. And so mm -hmm. I would highly encourage you, if you haven't already become familiar with uh, Resume Mencom's book, My Grandmother's Hand, but also he has available, and I'll make sure it's the uh, uh, a link to his okay. e-course that he has available if you want an introduction to some of the concepts that he's covering. But I wanted to kind of just acknowledge that uh, in this movement around Black Lives Matter that we attend to it and be mindful of it and find strategies to actually work through mm -hmm. it in really meaningful ways. And with that, I want to make sure my partner in crime, uh, Angela, I'll pass it off <laughs> to you. Thank you, Kazike. Thank you guys so much for being here this morning. And I really, really appreciate that example of information. That's a great resource. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna start us off with a little story um, and I'm gonna just kind of read it off. A monkey and a fish were caught in a terrible flood and were being swept downstream amidst torrents of water and debris. The monkey spied a branch from an overhanging tree and pulled himself to safety from the swirling water. Then wanting to help his friend, the fish, he reached into the water and pulled a fish from the water to the branch. So all of us are thinking, oh my gosh, like this is such an awesome like connection. We have the monkey who's very caring and wanting to help the fish. And the reason why I kind of introduced this particular story is because that sometimes we want to be helpful, but we, we're assuming that the help is what that individual needs. And sometimes when we're dealing with a crisis, trauma, and grief, it may not be what that person needs, right? So we sometimes can do more harm than good. So it's really important um, to really have information in regards to how that person's adapting just in general. On the next slide, we wanna make sure that when we're responding to crisis, trauma, and grief, that we learn about everybody's story, right? So we know that it's even more true when it comes to culture. There's so many different nuances when it comes to culture. We're looking at the person's um, individuality, how they cope within a, um, the, their own cultural environment. And we know that we wanna make sure that as we're providing some support when it comes to crisis, 
um, that we are very much in alignment or in agreement and in, in, um, knowledgeable about their uh, current situation. So in regards to the next slide, um, one of the pieces that we want to consider is that what we know is that minority groups are more likely than white Americans to seek treatment until symptoms are more severe. There's a lot of different um, pieces connected to research connected to that. But we also want to make sure that we're um, aware that a lot of different cultures use informal sources of support, especially in the cases of trauma. Uh, for example, some, some cultures may use family as a connection for um, getting through grief. Um, some cultures may use some, their spiritual religious leaders as a first connection. They don't seek mental health first um, within um, the context of their own culture. So we really want to make sure that as you are embracing this uh, information today, that you're mindful of your own values and prejudices. Um, also getting information and training and cultural competence really helps us to facilitate um, understanding how that person's reacting, right? Is this a normal reaction for this context? And so we want to make sure that we're utilizing some of the strengths, some of those resources to be able to support the families and the individuals that we're addressing um, and avoiding psychopathologizing some of these labels because maybe this is how the person is reacting and also utilizing those strengths to be able to connect uh, families to uh, resources. You know, if we don't know, it's important to just ask, you know, what happened, you know, the last time that this crisis or the situation happened? How did your family deal with it? Who is the one that you connect with, right? It's really getting involved with the, uh, with the family or the individual to make sure that they're, you're understanding their own cultural norms and, and also expectations. And one of the other pieces too that I also utilize is also the resiliency factor, right? There may be an experience where this individual has gone through multiple traumatic situations, um, but also wanting to make sure that we use this as a strength, right? How can we, as the uh, practitioners, either in a school setting or private practice or even within the community, how do we use some of this information um, to make sure that we're providing the right support for students? And also making sure that, um, that it's important for us to ask questions. So if we don't know the information, either ask the family, get consultation, or also a lot of these uh, practices that we use are westernized, so making sure that they are, um, you know, uh, they complement the family or they complement the individual that we're working with uh, in regards to crisis trauma and um, grief. Because you and I are going to be available at the end of this, um, the, the rest of the presentation, if you guys have any more questions. I'm going to send it back to Jessica. Great. Thank you so much for starting us off, Kazike and Angela. I really appreciate you sharing this information with us. Um, I see great comments in the chat box. There are a couple of questions in the Q&A pod that have been submitted. Our presenters will try to answer as many questions as they can in the Q&A pod. And we will also use the second part of the session today to have our presenters answer some of those questions live. So please do continue to submit your questions through the Q&A pod. I'll pass it off to PJ and Paul now. Thank you, PJ and Paul, for being with us today. Uh, thanks, Jessica. Um, I'm going to be moving quickly through a lot of information, um, so I um, hope you can bear with me. There's a lot of resources that have been attached to this slide deck, so a lot of the information that we're talking about is related to those resources. So if you feel like that we're moving past things, don't worry about that because there are a lot of resources uh, that list it so you can go right to the source um, to learn more about the things that you're hearing about today. Uh, and I know that I don't have to speak very long about the effects uh, that the current pandemic and trauma in general has on kids. Uh, in terms of sort of a hierarchy of needs, uh, families are facing housing insecurity, food insecurity, job insecurity, health insecurity, really sort of basic, basic needs um, that uh, the family requires are threatened right now. And you know, not all kids who are going through this are going to be developing PTSD, but it's fair to say that there's a huge number of students um, that are experiencing significant stress as a result of the pandemic. And one thing to be re really sort of thought about you know, right from the start is that this is not just affecting the students that we're working with. We all are um, experiencing this, um, that we're going through the same pandemic as them. 
and facing the same kinds of stresses uh, that they're facing in our own families um, as we try to uh, be uh, home because of the pandemic and trying to work uh, from there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, just in starting sort of more generally um, in speaking sort of about support that um, we can give to kids that have been affected. Um, I know it's very easily easy to say to be technologically fluent, um, but that sort of really is key. Um, I think Angela and Kazike were talking, uh, started us off talking about cultural considerations. I think it's important to acknowledge that equity in terms of access to technology um, that um, frequently uh, is disproportionately uh, affects uh, students of color uh, continues to be a really major barrier to being able to engage with kids at all um, in, in telehealth. Uh, that just needs to be so said right from the get go. But in general, if you are able to you know, be working with kids and, and have access to technology, really it's very, very important as all the presenters here today will talk with, about and, and would say with a lot of experience that you really need to um, always test things out before you try them the first time with, with technology. Always give extra time to try to troubleshoot uh, problems that are going to come up with technology when you're working with kids. Um, also, be very familiar with your district guidelines regarding technology. Districts have different uh, different uh, uh, prior uh, uh, different rules regarding which platform to use around screen sharing, uh, the way that you get consent uh, for treatment online, privacy and confidentiality, all the policies and procedures you know for the districts you should be really familiar with. Uh, and it's very helpful to be knowledgeable um, about what's going on with COVID-19. Um, about stress and trauma and the effects that that has on students. Um, we'll be talking about psychoeducation in a bit and uh, facts can be very comforting. Uh, it, it, it can be really helpful to be able to answer some of the students practical questions that they have about the pandemic. Uh, and that doesn't mean that you need to know everything. You also need to be resourceful. And if you don't have the answer, know where they can be found. And, in general, um, it's, it's about sort of engaging kids and how to do that online. And I know that many of you were thrown into telehealth um, pretty quickly without a lot of guidance or resources or tools to be using. And it's clear that the way that things work in person don't translate one-to-one -to, -one to an online format. Um, and there, we need to be changing a lot of the ways that we're engaging kids as we're moving online. And that can be really, uh, challenging, you know, all change is difficult, but from some of the conversations that we've had with clinicians, it's really important to be looking for opportunities and unexpected benefits um, in changing to online and so seeing how uh, using some of these new uh, techniques can uh, be useful. Um, with technology, it's sort of a lot of it can be sort of really basic around sort of logistics of uh, lighting and sound. Uh, kids are not going to be able to engage with you if they can't see you or hear you. Um, but really, if maximize whatever utility of, of the platforms uh, you're using have, uh, whether there's some chat features or screen sharing or some whiteboards, use all of them to be able to you know, engage uh, with the kids. It may require a more exaggerated enthusiasm in the way that we speak with kids um, and doing way more sort of checking in about sort of understanding uh, and agreement of what we're saying than you're used to in person, just to really keep our kids engaged. Also. Um, kids get tired online in ways that they may not uh, in person, and so having frequent breaks uh, also may be a way to sort of maintain uh, engagement. Um, we'll be needing to check in uh, with kids more, you know, more often and more thoroughly than we're used to, um, and, and really being there to solve immediate needs that kids are bringing forward as the families are moving through the pandemic. We're going to probably be seeing an increasing number of crises as the time moves by, and PJ will be talking about some of that uh, as, later on. Um, and but if you know we are seeing kids uh, in in great distress, uh, we'll sort of learn about sort of what to do to help stabilize them. Um, and screen fatigue is a real a real thing. Um, you take a tip from your own self when you learn at the end of the day that there's another extra Zoom meeting you have to go to, and that sort of dread about sort of a, what another meeting online is what kids are feeling as they're having to do their education online and multiple meetings online. 
really for ourselves and, our, and for our kids to really sort of think about that and limiting the amount of time that we're spending um, in, in contact, you know, on meetings with kids um, and really just sort of being, being so sensitive to the amount of time that, uh, that, that we're all spending on screens. And lastly, the most important thing is to really to be hopeful and to really be letting kids know that uh, they can learn new skills to, to cope better with the, the stress that they're feeling. Um, as we move into the future. Um, next slide. And these are just some uh, general uh, CBT uh, uh, skills that we can be working on with kids uh, around psychoeducation and self-regulation uh, and thought restructuring. Um, the, uh, these are sort of common to a lot of the treatments and so you, you may be sort of really familiar with them but really sort of helping kids understand that what they're going through and the things that they're feeling and uh, are, are really some common reactions uh, that people have uh, to stress. With younger kids, uh, we may be needing to go a little bit uh, more basic and really help them to develop a feeling vocabulary um, that younger kids tend to not have um, and can also be using body mapping to help, to help kids to learn sort of how their bodies are experiencing a trauma and how they can they can they can notice you know what's happening um, through reactions of their body. There are lots of self-regulation strategies that we can help kids with: uh, deep breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, and body scans. There are zillions and zillions of resources online, scripts, uh, you know, and uh, and handouts uh, related to all of these. Uh, they're readily available um, to you to really help kids be able to, on a very best level, be able to keep themselves regulated during these difficult times. Um, physical activation is particularly helpful um, for kids who are experiencing depression. Uh, and any, any kinds of activities that kids were uh, engaging in before that were really pleasurable and helped them to feel better, um, those are things we wanna keep encouraging kids to be doing. And even more helpfully, to help them de develop a schedule uh, to be able to participate in those activities. Even though I know at some point, you know, during the COVID-19, it's difficult to do all the things that you did before, um, but to try to get kids to be uh, really engaging in all of the activities that help them to stay relaxed before. And last is sort of thought restructuring, really getting kids to, uh, teaching kids about the connections between what they're thinking about something that happened and how, you know, and how they feel about it. Um, to get them to be identifying really helpful thoughts to be able to, uh, to be able to you know, face some of the challenges that they're facing. Next slide. I'm going to be very quickly, uh, relationships are probably what, uh, the loss of them are probably what students report uh, that has been sort of the most, uh, most difficult. Um, we'll be talking about grief later on, and increasingly kids will have, you know, be knowing people who have uh, succumbed to uh, the virus. Um, but they've lost a real wide range of, uh, you know, of, of relational supports. Um, kids report that uh, in schools, they have been able to really stay in touch with their um, main close friends online, but they've lost a lot of secondary relationships that were very important to them in, in, in classmates. Um, so I think that just really needing to sort of acknowledge uh, the level of loss that kids are feeling right now and to really sort of engage families um, and teachers and school staff in ways to be able to uh, help you know provide additional support and we're finding in talking to clinicians that online groups kids tend to be engaging in a much a stronger way than in individual treatments so i really want to uh, encourage people to be running online groups kids are starved for relationships and, and and groups is a way to get them to stay connected and to provide uh, support to one another, which is really important and helpful to the kids. Um, next slide. And lastly, um, we, we all know that it's our job to be nurturing and protecting the students that we work with, but it's really important for all of us to be nurturing and protecting ourselves and our own capacity to be helping uh, this, uh, these students. Um, and, the first way is to really be aware of the signs and symptoms of secondary traumatic stress. Um, there are a great number of resources on the National Child Traumatic Stress Network website, nctsn.org, related to secondary traumatic stress. And there's a, um, a, a one particular resource for child caring um, professionals uh, that's, in their, in, that's in the slide deck. 
it's really helpful to the most helpful way to you know give you to uh, use self care is to really incorporate self care practices into your daily routines. I know this can sometimes feel like an additional burden, um, but things that that help just like we're teaching the students we work with to be doing the activities that make them feel good, we need to be taking our own advice and do that for ourselves and incorporate things that help us to stay um, energized um, and mindful um, to be doing those things regularly uh, throughout the day. And, it, and the, you know, resilience doesn't just reside in our own selves, the organizations that we're a part of and we work with uh, and for, you know, really also we need to understand how do, how do these organizations really help support the resilience of the staff who are working there. And if you're finding that, you know, that you really are, are feeling, uh, having really some serious, you know, symptoms of post-traumatic stress to really um, be getting additional help, um, all in the, uh, in the um, working toward really nurturing and protect our ability to be helping students. Um, again, there's lots of other resources that are in, you know, mentioned later on in the, in the slide deck, so that are there for additional information about this. And I'm going to pass it on to PJ. PJ, we can't hear you. I think you're still muted if you'd like to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Thank you, PJ. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody and thank you for being here. It's, I'm so happy to see so many people in the field wanting to learn and grow to provide the best services we can to our clients that we serve. Um, I'm going to be reviewing handling the crisis via telehealth um, and what the number one thing that I can tell people is that we need to be prepared and be proactive um, with telehealth. Uh, so we need to start every session with finding out where our students location is. I have a index card for all of my clients where I have on their address, their apartment number, their phone numbers, emergency contacts, kind of like an emergency card that you would have at school but I have that in every client's folder so that I have access to that when I'm online with them. And I don't always assume that they're at home. So some of my students are visiting their friends. And when I see that they're in a different environment, because I've been doing the telehealth for a period of time, I can recognize now when they're not in their house. Um, I do ask them where they're at and I get the address and they know that I'm asking that for safety purposes. Um, making sure that we have an emergency contact information, parents, guardians, uncles, um, and I develop a contact plan in case the call or video gets interrupted if I get cut off. So I have on my index card, I have the student's cell phone, I have their parents' cell phone. So in case I'm in the middle of something and they are in a crisis and we get cut off, that I have access to them still. Um, securing privacy on both sides during the session. I really talk to my clients about where they are and if doors are closed and if they feel that people are listening and do they have privacy? I also make sure that I'm in a private spot on my end. Um, students, teenagers, and children are very in tune to if you are um, occupied with something else while you're on telehealth with them. They are also very in tune to what's going on around you. So um, I have a dog who jumps into my telehealth every now and then, and the children love the dog. But again, they're, they're very in tune to what's going on around you. Um, in terms of a crisis, we're gonna talk about assessing crisis situations. Crisis may not always be suicide in this day and age of, of COVID. Um, they may be experiencing that they have no food or that they have no electric, and that may be a crisis for them. So we really need to be talking and listening. And like Angela said, you know, some of our underprivileged populations don't have all the resources, and we really need to be talking to them about what resources they have. Um, and developing a plan prior to the contact for how to stay in touch with the client if there's an emergency. So again, you know, I have the privilege of having two cell phones. So when I'm on with a client, I have two cell phones available so that I can call emergency services and also still be addressing my client. Next slide, please. Next slide. Thank you. So when we're assessing for suicide um, in this day and age, we, we encourage people to ask the question, are you thinking about killing yourself? And I know that people are uncomfortable with that. When we do suicide trainings, I've had clinicians say to me, 
it's really hard for me to ask, but we really need to ask that question. And in this time, day and age, we really need to be reading between the lines. So children aren't necessarily telling you that they're thinking about suicide, but they will tell you, they will make statements like, I'm stuck, I can't take this anymore, I feel trapped, I can't move, I can't get out of bed. We really need to ask them about what that's about. What does that mean? What does that look like for you? Um, keeping them safe, asking if, you know, there is lethal means that they have at home. We don't necessarily think about that, but in homes there are lots of medications. Some homes have firearms that are not necessarily locked up or secured. And I, in my clients and my practice, I have a conversation with the parents well before I begin telehealth with the child or the teenager about what is available. What are the lethal means in their home? Because I need to know that as a clinician. Um, the next thing is really being there, listening carefully and learning what the individual is thinking and feeling. So we can't assume that they are thinking and feeling like we are. Although we're all in sort of a lockdown and stay at home, we may not all be handling that the same way. And certainly in some homes there is domestic violence and there's other crises that are going on. And we really need to be talking and listening to our, our teenagers and our children. Um, Sometimes during telehealth, we do have parents engage in the, in the sessions. If there is an emergency or there is a crisis, you may want to ask the parent to join the session. Um, I also have always available to me my, my numbers for prevention, um, and I help them connect to that. And at the, end of this slide, at the end of this slide, you'll see that I have lots of numbers for resources, and I make sure my children and my families have those numbers. So I give them to them when we're on the telehealth session. I also snail mail those resources to both the parents and the child so that if I'm not available, that they have someone to talk to. Um, and then staying connected. Research shows the number of suicide deaths go down when there is somebody there for the person who is at risk. And again, sometimes a you might have to do three 20 minute sessions with your clients or your students three times a week versus one 60 minute session that we typically were doing when we were in person in an office. Um, and sometimes a follow up call. I tend to be doing a lot more follow up calls right now with my clients just to touch base and say, hey, I know you were having a hard time yesterday. How are you today? And I might do an index. Um, next slide, please. PJ, there's a delay between when I move the slide and the time you see it. Um, so I apologize. Okay. That's fine. So the next slide, you'll see some of the suicide assessments that I use. On the left is the Columbia Suicide Scale. Very easy, quick, four or five questions. You can ask the client to determine what the risk level is. Also on the other side is the ask. Again, four questions, five questions that you can ask, get the answers to, assess where they're at. Again, sometimes we know that if we talk to an at-risk person about suicide, we can sway them from thinking a suicidal thought or making a suicide attempt to having another alternative to deal with whatever that issue is. But it's really important. And these, for clinicians that I work with in supervision who are very uncomfortable with asking the question directly, these scales are really easy for them to use because it gives them the question. So they can just read off it and they can make a check mark. And I will make several copies of this and put it in client's files so that I can do it repeatedly over sessions and make sure that they are staying in a healthy place and that I am monitoring their risk level. Next slide, please. On the next slide, you'll see that I have given you crisis hotlines and resources. These are the ones that I give to my clients as well. I make sure that they have them. I make sure that their parents have them. It's important right now with the COVID and people being shut in homes that we give the resources to everyone in the home. Um, so again, you'll have access to this later. I know that I'm going through this relatively quickly, but we are on limited time and we want to get to your Q&A. Next slide, please. So when we talk about 
um, goals for intervention around grief for students. Paul went over some of the things that are causing some of the loss in grief for students. Um, we want to decrease the isolation. So a lot of times my students are saying, well, I have friends, but I tried to make a Zoom call, but nobody could do it. And they get very disappointed and they feel very isolated. And I try to give them an alternative. So what else can you do? You couldn't get everybody on the Zoom call, so what could you do? And we talk about emailing them or writing them a snail mail letter. You know, my, my teenagers are all learning how to use the mail system now. Um, and writing letters and sending cards and silly things to their friends, which is really a nice way for them to connect. Um, supporting them in their academic function. They are having just as much difficulty as we are with remote learning. And so sometimes they are feeling frustrated and they need some help or they're feeling very incompetent or that they are, you know, I've had a lot of students say to me, well, I'm just stupid, I don't get this stuff. And I give them some resources. Um, I give them Khan Academy a lot where they can actually see a body, walk them through whatever the problem is that they have. But again, I'm supporting it. Some of my students who are in high school are telling me, well, you know, it doesn't matter. It's pass fail. You know, my grades don't matter, but I try to still keep them invested. And I let them talk to me about what they're doing with their academics. Um, we want to try to increase increase the likelihood that they will talk to their family. And sometimes this is not where especially teenagers will go, but if we can identify another family member like an aunt or an uncle or a cousin or someone that they do identify with, that could be an increase in family connection. And I also increase the likelihood of talk and support among their peers. So what I have for the students, and I have them do this with me on the Zoom session um, via the whiteboard, is we do a support plan. And what I have them do is identify 10 people that they will reach out to if there's a crisis or if they're feeling sad or they're feeling very lonely or they're having some grief reactions. And we identify 10 people. Three of those have to be an adult person. The rest can be their peers because a lot of times they will just want to put all their friends down. And I get them to try to give me contacts for those people so that they have their support plan and I have the support plan. Um, and then I get a copy of it and I give it to them and I might give it to their parents. You know, identifying problems in the family. There's a lot of things that we're looking at right now in terms of financial stability and economic issues and parents out of work or sometimes parents with COVID or family members with COVID. And we really need to listen to our students and our teenagers and our clients. What are they saying? What might be a crisis to us may not be a crisis to them and vice versa. What may be a crisis to them may not be a crisis to us. So we really need to identify those problems and ourselves as clinicians need to have resource lists. So I'm in a collegial group and we are constantly passing around resources for these people are giving free food out tomorrow or these people are helping with electric. Um, there's a whole list online of free Wi-Fi for all across the United States. Um, so those resources we need to be aware of so that we can pass them on to our clients. And then connecting with students on something of importance, immense importance, something to them. Um, really talking to them about what is important to them right now. Because sometimes it's not always school, which is what I hear from the teachers saying, oh, they're disconnected. Well, yes, they're disconnected. They're a little disconnected from themselves at the moment. So again, we need to work on connecting with them on one thing. Next slide. So we have a lot of do's for working with students who are grieving. Um, we really need to be present and authentic and, and be real. You know, more than ever, kids know on telehealth, it is so much more, they are so much more aware of whether we are being real or whether we are being present or whether we are paying attention to them um, and vice versa. We know when they're distracted and when they're doing something else. Um, so it is about engaging them. And like Paul said, sometimes we need to use exaggerated gestures. Thumbs up when I understand something they're saying or thumbs down when I'm thinking that's not so good either. Um, we need to listen more and talk less. Um, let them run the session, they, we really need to give them control because they're feeling like they have so little control right now. Um, you know, 
So again, listening more and talking less. And I tell people, you know, our job is not to be the cheerleader. We're not cheering up our students or families. We're helping them to develop some coping strategies during this time and coping strategies around their grief. Um, allowing for emotional expression. I have a lot of students who are saying we can't cry because our parents get upset or we can't be angry because they're telling us that, you know, we have it good or things like that. So in a session over telehealth, there are times when clients and children and students will cry and I let them cry. I sit there with the crying and I allow them to cry and I encourage them to cry. You know, also when they're angry, I encourage them to be angry and what can we do? And sometimes I will do an angry work, work out with them. You know, let's get a pillow, let's hit it, let's say something. Um, important to demonstrate empathy and not sympathy. We don't wanna be in a position where we're feeling bad for people. We really want to be able to empathize with them. And the way we do that is to allow them to tell us what their world looks like and what it is that their grief looks like so that we can understand it. And we tell them, you know, I want to understand it from your eyes. I wanna see it from your position. And then we want to stop harmful reactions when safety is a concern. I know, um, you know, Paul talked about the thinking, feeling, doing triangle. That's a great exercise to do with clients in the place of grief. Um, also, we noticed that there is an increase in substance uses. My teenagers are telling me they're smoking a lot more pot these days. And we talk about what else can you do besides doing those things, you know, so we want to do that. Next slide, please. So what I've compiled here is a list of what to say and what not to say to help people out. Um, what to say in terms of a grief situation or even a traumatic situation is, I know exactly what you're going through. We don't want to say that. You know, I can only imagine this. Tell me what it's like for you. You know, you must be incredibly angry. I try not to put emotions to my clients. I let them assign their emotions themselves. You know, what kind of feelings are you having around this? You know, sometimes people do have strong feelings and they feel angry or they feel sad. You know, has this been true for you? Um, and then, you know, what have the last few days been like for you? Sometimes it helps kids to just talk about what their day has been like and have somebody listen. Next slide, please. Again, you know, I know this must be difficult, but it's important to remember the good things in life as well. Not a good thing to say right now because sometimes they can't think of the good thing. So what we try to do is tell, get them to tell us about the person. I wanna know this person through your eyes or I wanna know this situation through your eyes. You know, we try not to get our stuff into it. Both of my parents died when I was your age. Not helpful. Avoid talking about our, ourselves and stay focused with the student and their feelings, unless of course they ask you. They may ask you, have you ever lost anybody? Next slide, please. You know, again, you'll need to be strong now for your family. It's important to get a grip on your feelings. It's not a good thing to say. I encourage them to express any and all feelings and we give them permission for all of those feelings. You know, a lot of times in schools, you know, we don't want kids to be angry. And so kids learn to squelch that feeling. So I'm really encouraging them to have those feelings. You know, and again, I don't compare losses, especially, you know, in the COVID, you know, I hear the the kids join that. Well, I had a friend who lost two people and I had a friend who lost three people. And we try to get out of that. We try not to compare the losses, but focus on their experience. You know, on telehealth, you know, we can do some of those things like, you know, have the, the children or the students, you know, draw pictures or do collages, or there are some games that we can play around grief, you know, the goodbye game um, and good grief, which are resources that are on the end of this. Um, and I find that a good intervention for trauma and grief, I'm just gonna close up in the last minute, is to incorporate the four C's. And I learned the four C's at a trauma conference just last week, and they are connection, control, competence, and contribution. So connecting with somebody, identifying what we can control and letting go of what we can't, knowing what we're competent in and where our skills are, and then contributing something. So that's also a plan that I use with my students and it seems to be really in having a good effect on especially the teenagers who are thinking of ways to contribute to the community during these very trying times. 
So again, you'll see the resources at the end. We have lots of resources for you, and I know you get a lot of information from web series, but please look into them. All of the resources that Paul and myself have been, you know, collecting for you, there's some really good stuff in there for you to look at. So with that, I'm going to pass it back to Jessica for the Q&A part. Paul and PJ, Angela and Kazike, seriously, thank you so much for this great content. We appreciate you sharing your expertise with us. We do have several questions in the Q&A pod, and so we have about 12 minutes to get through as many questions as we can. I will let Nadia Maynard, our trauma-informed healing-centered practices specialist with the MHTC network, lead us through our Q&A portion today. Hi, Nadia. Hi, Jessica. Thank you so much. So um, there were a lot of interesting uh, questions that came up in the Q&A pod, and we're going to start off with one that's related to equity and inclusion around the trauma-informed care model. So the question was, uh, what trauma-informed care model would you recommend for an agency that uh, predominantly provides services for people of color? And um, I do notice that uh, that also Kazike shared a resource around healing-centered engagement mm -hmm. by um, Sean Ginwright, but I wanted to uh, flesh that out a little bit more to, to both of our panelists, uh, Angela and Kazike. Mm -hmm. You wanna go first, Angela? Uh, sure. Well, um, one of the things I actually recommended a couple of other different resources on there as well, the Treatment and Service Adaptation Center and also the National Center for Trauma, um, they both have really great models um, and resources for integrating a culturally uh, trauma responsive plan. Um, so that's something that you guys can actually research. There's a lot of really great resources there. So, and if you wanted to add on to that piece, because we can. Yeah, I think one thing that we consider of, um, the reason why I emphasize the book, My Grandmother's Hands, because one of the things that the author really emphasized is that talk therapy alone by mm -hmm. itself is insufficient as an approach mm -hmm. to deal with trauma, particularly with uh, communities of color, but even for people who are, who are non uh, who are who are white or otherwise? Uh, it it kind of it, it keeps things intellectual. It doesn't really deal mm -hmm. with the, the, the trauma that's right. stored in our bodies. And so, mm -hmm. as far as a, a model is concerned, is really looking at how do we tap into not just the intellectual kind of talking cures that we're focused on, but also how do we release the trauma that is stored in our body? And I think the book mm -hmm. My Grandmother's Hands provides a model for approaching that work from a very different perspective. Because I think many of our training tends to be on the intellectual when we have not attended yeah. to the body work that's necessary. Yeah, and I think the other piece too to add on to that is, you know, we talked about equity piece and accessibility is making sure that the other piece to consider is, you know, um, language, right? So making sure that the information is accessible in the language that, that your community is familiar with. Um, I think one of the, the most um, effective programs that I know that I've seen, it's called the Promotoras program, which is a Latino-based program where you can train community members in the area of mental health. It, it initially started off with diabetes and a health um, concept, but just really integrating that community, um, even spiritual. I've seen, you know, connection with um, some of the spiritual religious uh, communities in the area. So just really like integrating and looking at your your population and resources that you have available. There's so many different great ideas out there. Thank you so much, Angela and Kizike. Um, so another question that came up in the Q&A pod was around co-occurring concerns related to, the, um, to, to substance use to cope with trauma. Mm -hmm. PJ, I don't know if you wanted to field that question. So um, <clears throat> it, it seems that I, I, I might have lost PJ. Um, if you can either unmute yourself, or I can also go to the next right. question. No, I'm right here. OK. Mm -hmm. so, so in terms of substance abuse for people who are experiencing traumatic exper events, we know that that is an easy go-to. And so what mm -hmm. we really need to do is give people other alternatives. Um, and what we're finding in the trauma field is that a lot of that is some of the body work, 
um, yoga, Tai Chi, Kwai Kan, moving in our bodies, getting back into our bodies, meditation. And I will do that with my clients on telehealth. I will teach them. I will do it with them. And I will check in with them if they're practicing those things. Okay, and, and while we have you too, um, PJ, um, someone asked for a repeat of the three C's again, or the four, I thought you said four C's, but. Um, four C's. The yes. four C's, they connection, um, control, confidence, and contribution. Yes, and so um, the next is not a question, but more of a comment, and, um, and I'll point people to the, the fact that we've been uh, sharing resources and encourage you to share resources in the chat box as well that we'll be able to send out afterwards. There was a lot of questions around uh, providing recommendations for young people on anti-racism and cultural um, competence. And so uh, I know that Kazike, you shared um, a list as well. We'll be sure to send those out. Um, and then another question on the tools that were, were referenced, um, PJ, are those research-based? Yes, they are both research-based, yes. The Columbia mm -hmm. Suicide Scale has been researched extensively, as well as the ASK, mm -hmm. and if you go on either of their sites, um, you'll see mm -hmm. all of the research-based things. Yes, and, and um, another question that just came in around can you address the effect of isolation for our students? Are there resources mm -hmm. for this area or ways our presenters have done this? Resources for the students to decrease isolation? Yes. Um, so there is a lot of um, applications on the phone that students are using. I did not include those on the resources, but if whoever asks the question wants to email me, I'll certainly give that information to you. Um, we are encouraging our students who are becoming more adept on Google Chats and some of the other online mm -hmm. group rooms. There's like movie places they can watch movies together. Um, I don't have those resources included, but like I said, if you email me, I will send them to you. And also, um, and I, I just wanted to add, if I, Go if ahead. I could add, uh, PJ just sort of mentioned uh, sort of yoga, and I wanted to sort of add mindfulness to uh, ways that uh, people can uh, sort of help relieve the stress. And there are a lot of online apps related to mindfulness that uh, that are widely used, uh, uh, that uh, available for kids that they find very helpful. Um, Headspace is one of them, but there's zillions of them, uh, lots and lots of resources online for kids to uh, incorporate mindfulness practices. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and and this goes, this might um, also go along with the, kind of the, the strategies, but to help students with grief, and have you considered the use of music and art to help them through the grieving process? Mm -hmm. Can you speak to oh, that? Absolutely. Angle? Yes, we use we use music, art, um, I do a lot of experiential stuff, so I will have students draw with me on the whiteboard in a Zoom session, in a telehealth session, or I will have them have art supplies on their side, and we draw pictures, mm -hmm. and I draw pictures, and we exchange them. So, and we, I always have music going in the background when I am working with a student, um, and mm -hmm. sometimes we, that's an, we connect on. They choose the music one week, I choose the music the next week, and so we talk about our music and how it makes us feel. So absolutely, those things are really, really important. And I would just add that um, when I integrated TSCBT and CBITS, um, one of the programs that I did was the integrating CBITS or cognitive behavioral intervention for trauma in schools for newcomers. Um, I asked the kids like what they used in their family or, or their culture to help them um, deal with some of the situation like maybe like some practices that they use uh, that's helpful as well because a lot of times in practicing like mindfulness that may not be something that their culture uh, was very familiar with so it, it just it took a little adapting for for them to really understand the yoga practices those kinds of things so it was it's just important to ask those questions too yeah Angela I'm glad you mentioned that because I think one of the things is that I think we want to bring to bring some skills and tools to our families and young people who are working on that question of what are they already doing and tapping into the 
the gifts they already bring to the table. Um, and so, uh, again, my grandmother's hands and really articulating the kinds of activities that we're already doing to help set ourselves to how, how we, so we, and it's a way of having a conversation about how we do those things like mindfulness, but maybe not in the language of mindfulness, but we find ways of uh, taking care of ourselves in really powerful ways. We're just having that conversation of what that looks like to them culturally and what they're accustomed to is an important conversation to have with our, with our young people. Thank you so much, Kazike. So we are running low on time. I think I have room for one more question before we um, begin uh, closing out and wrapping up. But um, one more question coming from uh, folks there is, what are some good resources for self-harming assessing, for assessing self-harm? So the resources that I use, I'm, again, I start with the Columbus or the F scale. Um, mm -hmm. But then I think it's just asking the question. Mm -hmm. What are you going to do? If a child says, you know, I'm cutting, then we need to address it. I don't know that there is a self-harm assessment out there per se, besides mm -hmm. those two kids. Um, I think it's really having a conversation about what it is you're using. You know, if mm -hmm. you ask a youth, are you cutting? They're gonna say no, but they might be doing something else. So we really need to have a conversation mm -hmm. about what tool are you using to soothe yourself or to take away this pain or to deal with it? Because they mm -hmm. might tell you, well, you know, I wrap rubber bands around my wrist and I, I make a mark. Well, I wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. get that if I had some cutting. So I really have to have a conversation with them about what it is that you are using to help mm -hmm. yourself soothe yourself mm -hmm. or feel this pain. And then again, it's giving them additional tools mm -hmm. that they can use besides the self-harming tool. Mm -hmm. Oh, I just saw a really amazing question that we didn't have the time for. Um, and I, I apologize, we ran short. Um, so I, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the time for all the questions, but we do have an FAQ. I'm going to hand it over to Jessica that, um, you know, but before I do that, explaining our FAQs, uh, basically any questions that come up, we will try to address um, the more frequently asked ones and um, provide those resources and tools for you after uh, the webinar. Thank you, Jessica. Great, thank you so much, Nadia. So we are getting close to the top of the hour. Thank you everyone for joining us today. It has been our pleasure bringing this session to all of you. Today's presentation and slides um, and the recording will be sent to everyone in a follow-up email over the next few days. Um, like Nadia said, we will also make these materials available on the MHTTC website. And in addition to the recording and presentation slides, we will be posting a set of frequently asked questions based on the questions asked in the Q&A pod. And we will make sure to include links to resources uh, that were mentioned during the Q&A portion. Um, please note that if you missed any of our previous webinars uh, from the series, you can find links and resources for those as well on our MHTTC website. And you'll see the link to our website on the screen there. Um, to wrap this up, we do have an exciting announcement. We're happy to share that part two of this series will launch in late summer, early fall, uh, later this year. So to stay informed on part two of the series and other upcoming MHTTC events, training opportunities and resources, please subscribe to our newsletter. We have the QR code on the screen uh, right there for you to scan with your phone, or you can also subscribe by visiting our website. Next slide. And just a very quick reminder, please take a moment to complete a very brief survey about today's training. You will be redirected to our survey upon closing the Zoom webinar. We will also be including the link to our survey in our follow-up email to everyone who attended today. So thank you again to our wonderful speakers for their time and expertise. A big thank you to all of you for joining us today, for taking time out of your day to be with us. Please take care of yourselves, be safe. Um, thank you for all that you do for schools and students across the country. We hope that you'll continue to access our MHTTC resources and trainings. Thank you again. Have a good day.